As you can see from our reading today, we're continuing our series on voyages. And in this reading, we see Paul doing a lot of travelling. I was trying to think of someone in our own times who does a lot of travelling around the world. And surprise, surprise, I fairly quickly brought to mind our own general, the general of the Salvation Army. Now, like many international church denominations, the Salvation Army has one single leader who has the ultimate spiritual and administrative responsibility for the global Salvation Army. And this person is given the unique rank of general. And interestingly, one of the general's main tasks seems to be travelling around the world, meeting Salvationists and their friends and supporters, preaching to them, and also meeting with the Salvation Army's leaders in different countries to discuss matters of administration and doctrine. And of course, whilst visiting the various territories around the world, the General also tries to encourage support and comfort members and officers in those places. And here's a picture of our current General, General Brian Peddell, on his visit to Northern India in February of this year. So in normal times, the General would be travelling fairly constantly throughout the year and clocking up an enormous amount of miles. However, as we're all now getting tired of saying, these are not normal times, and therefore the General, like everyone else, is restricted to travelling virtually on the seas of the internet. I imagine that the General's personal motivation for all his travelling would actually be similar, in part, to the Apostle Paul's. Like Paul, General Peddle wants to bring guidance, encouragement and sound teaching to the church of which he is the leader. He also wants to explain to his people his decisions and the positions he's taken on various issues on behalf of the whole army. No doubt he also wants to see how his churches are doing and perhaps as he comes to the end of his four-year term as general he also wants to say a few goodbyes as he knows that when he leaves office there's a good chance that he may, may never see some of these people again in the flesh. Our Bible reading describes what is known as Paul's third missionary journey, which scholars think occurred sometime between 53 and 57 AD. And it's somewhat different to Paul's first two missionary journeys because they focused mostly on planting new churches in parts of what was then Asia Minor, a region of the Roman Empire. Now here's a map showing the path of the third missionary journey. And as you can see, this third journey was a return to where Paul's new life as an apostle really started, Jerusalem. And it's a return journey with a particular purpose. Paul is bringing reports of the growth of the Christian church among the Gentiles of Asia Minor back to the founding church in Jerusalem. And he's also bringing with him a large offering of money from those same Gentile churches which they have donated to help out the Judean Christians who are in financial difficulties. Knowing that there were still those among the Jewish Christians who had doubts about the idea of Gentiles becoming Christians, Paul knew that this monetary offering to the poor of the Judean church would be a powerful symbol of the truth that Gentile and Jewish Christians were all equally members of the Church of Jesus Christ. On his journey back to Jerusalem, Paul stopped at several places on the way and took the opportunity to catch up with local churches and their leaders, providing guidance, encouragement and teaching, and also pastoral care. But this journey had something extra, an extra spiritual dimension, if you like, because throughout the journey, Paul had a premonition that got stronger and stronger as he got closer and closer to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit was making clear to Paul and also to others with the gift of prophecy in the church, that something bad, something dangerous, was waiting for Paul in Jerusalem. And if we remember some of his bad experiences on his previous travels, recorded in Acts, it wasn't difficult to guess what that something might be. Arrest, violence, maybe even death. Now, maybe I'm a bit sad. But I think it's kind of interesting that in an age without trains, airplanes, coaches and cars, it appears the most efficient way of getting Paul and his team from Greece to Jerusalem was to travel by ship. 
and it may have well been the safest way also, given that many of the roads and tracks were hunting grounds for bandits and robbers. However, next week, the idea of say, sea travel being safe will be shown to be highly questionable when we see how Paul gets caught in a storm at sea on his way to Rome. So Paul sets out on his voyage towards Jerusalem, towards an uncertain future, a future that he knows will involve a degree of suffering and danger, and a destiny that will be very different to his present life as a travelling church leader, mentor, teacher and shepherd of his Gentile flock. However, he sets out anyway because he believes that the Holy Spirit has told him that this journey is God's will for him. So we might say that he's sailing with the Spirit. And I think that Paul's experience of sailing with the Spirit shows us three things. Firstly, that sailing with the Spirit requires courage. Then sailing with the Spirit will bring some sadness. And that sailing with the Spirit always involves loving and being loved. I've already mentioned that Paul knew from the Holy Spirit that he faced serious trouble in Jerusalem. And at various points on his journey, when they discovered this, his Christian brothers and sisters tried to persuade him to turn back. In the verses that follow our reading in chapter 21, a Christian prophet called Agabus comes to Caesarea to tell Paul that he will be arrested in Jerusalem. In response, not only the Christians at Caesarea, but even Paul's own team members try to convince him, with tears in their eyes, not to go there. We can feel some of the anguish and sadness that's growing in Paul as we read his reply to their pleading. He says, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. This is the emotional summit of Paul's journey, and it demonstrates these three aspects of sailing with the Spirit. First of all, it clearly shows Paul's courage. He is determined to continue obeying the leading of the Spirit, even though it will cause him suffering and pain, and perhaps even the loss of his life. Secondly, it shows Paul's deep sadness as he witnesses their distress, caused by their love and concern for him, and their natural desire to keep him safe with them. He also perhaps feels sadness as he knows that this part of his life, in which he has had the freedom to travel around his circuit of churches, is now coming to an end, and he will never see some of his beloved brethren in these churches again. We've already seen something of this sadness when Paul met with the leaders of the Ephesian church at Miletus in Acts chapter 20 and verses 17 to 20. Uh, he tells the leaders there what the Spirit has been saying to him about how his trip to Jerusalem will lead to prison and hardship. He goes on to tell them that he knows he will never see them again and reminds them of the example that he's set them, how he's worked hard, never using his position in the church for financial gain, and how he's constantly reinforced in them the truths of the gospel. He then charges them to look after their church and to watch out for those seeking to disrupt the fellowship through false teaching. Finally, in a particularly poignant moment, Paul kneels down with them to pray for them in person for what will be the last time. And they cry. And perhaps he cried too. And then they all walk with him down to the dock, see him onto the ship, and he continues on with his journey. I would suggest that this sadness that they all feel at this moment is also a demonstration of the final aspect of sailing with the Spirit, which is that it will always involve loving and being loved. It is because the Ephesian leaders and the other Christians at Caesarea and Paul's companions all love him, that they feel so sad that he is to be taken from them and so disturbed by what might happen to him. And it's because Paul's great of Paul's great love for them that he insists on continuing on to Jerusalem because he knows that obeying the Spirit's direction is the most loving thing that he can do for his brothers and sisters in Christ, both those around him now and also those who will come to faith as a result of his witness in Jerusalem and later in Rome. Paul's God-given task was to preach the gospel of Jesus, no matter how dangerous that might be, no matter what sacrifices it would entail, and like Jesus' own teaching and his sacrifice on the cross, Paul's journey was an act of love. 
because the Spirit would use it to save others and bless generations of Christians. Now, I really wouldn't want to begin to compare myself with my namesake, Paul, but since my own encounter with Christ in my early 30s, I think I've come to understand a little bit about sailing with the Spirit. When Jesus called me into full-time ministry as a Salvation Army officer, that for me too was a journey of discovery towards my future destiny. I had lived most of my life on the south coast of England. I'd made a life there, having worked in local government for 13 years. So I had a career, I was renting a flat, I had bought a car, I had Christian friends who I'd known for more than 20 years, and I'd been an active member of the Salvation Army in Portsmouth for over 30 years, serving God through music making and children's work at my church. Portsmouth and Southampton were my patch, and the church in Portsmouth had become like a family to me. And then, when I was 34, Jesus called me to leave that life and go on a journey into the unknown, which involved giving up my job in 1997 and relocating to the William Booth College in South London to begin two years of full-time training for ministry. Now, I've never thought of myself as being particularly courageous, but I suppose as I cast off and set up, sailed away from the future that I had imagined for myself and towards an unknown future that God had prepared for me, there were definitely moments when I needed to find a small amount of courage in order to face some of the difficulties that awaited me on that journey. And as I said goodbye to all the routines and certainties of my previous life, and to certain precious friendships, I certainly did feel some sadness. But I hope that like Paul, I boarded that ship and sailed off out of love. Love for my saviour Jesus, above all, but also out of love for all my lovely Christian friends that I left behind, and love for all those people that God was going to put in my way in the future. I was convinced that my journey would take me deeper into the love of God, and that would make me better able to love others. In the end, of course, God will be the judge of how well that I have saved with, sailed with the Spirit, and whether, like the Apostle Paul, I stayed the course to the very end. But then, that's true of all of us. Now, we may not be sailing with the Spirit over the Mediterranean Sea, like Paul, nor being asked to leave our homes and jobs to take up full-time ministry. But I think that we are all, in a sense, sailing with the Spirit through this time of pandemic. Just like Paul, we don't know exactly what awaits us in Jerusalem. But we know that our journey through this pandemic will continue to be tough and we will be exposed to risk. As we continue to try and minister to those in our family, friendship circles and in our workplaces, the risks we face are real. And as we've seen, Paul was prepared to continue with his ministry and face the hardships that he was certain lay before him. And he was able to do this because he knew he would be doing it for the name of Jesus. In other words, Paul's arrest and detention in Jerusalem would lead to many opportunities for him to testify to his life-changing encounter with Jesus and to preach Jesus' gospel of love. And indeed, Acts tells us that following his arrest, despite being a prisoner, Paul would go on to address crowds of thousands to tell his conversion story to Roman governors and to the king of Judea, and to continue his ministry of teaching, mentoring and encouragement from imprisonment in Rome through his letters. And of course, millions of Christians since then have been blessed by the teaching ministry contained in Paul's letters that were written during this imprisonment. And eventually, according to ancient traditions of the church, Paul made the ultimate sacrifice for his faith when he was executed during Emperor Nero's persecution of Christians between 62 and 67 AD. Paul's sailing with the Spirit had a huge impact upon those to whom he ministered to directly and upon the history of the church and thus the world. And this can also be true of us today. If we're prepared to sail with the Spirit in obedience to his calling and direction, whilst it will require courage and it will bring some sadness upon the way, our journey will bring more love into the world because we're sailing with the Spirit of love, the Spirit of Jesus, God 
the Holy Spirit. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying to you about your own voyage over the sea of the pandemic, but of one thing I am certain, and that is that God's love has not changed because of the pandemic. Our loving God longs for all people everywhere to hear the good news about Jesus, which is that he is the Son of God, who by his divine power has overcome sin and death. And I'm also certain that our loving God desires for all of his people, every Christian, to be involved in the same mission to which the Apostle Paul dedicated his life. The mission of lifting up the name of Jesus in our homes, our communities, in our society and throughout the whole world. Sailing with the Spirit will require us to have courage because evil will oppose us, just as it opposed Jesus and Paul. Sailing with the Spirit will also involve some sadness because our journey will bring us into contact with suffering. There are many people who are hurting and grieving in our community today. Grieving for the loss of the freedoms they once had, grieving for loved ones who are sick or who have died, hurting because their financial situation is uncertain or is under threat or is becoming desperate, hurting because they now find themselves destitute, hurting because they feel isolated and alone. And as we see this grieving and hurting, we hurt too, because we know them and we love them. And perhaps the temptation might be to simply turn away, to protect ourselves, to spare ourselves the pain of sadness by withdrawing into our distractions, instead of coming alongside those who are grieving and hurting in order to encourage and support them. Or perhaps the temptation might be to harden our hearts against them, to point the finger of blame, to rationalise and to judge, to shrug our shoulders and hunker down, instead of allowing ourselves to feel empathy for the pain of others. I'm sure that Paul believed that when the name of Jesus was truly honoured, in every house, in every council chamber, in every boardroom, and every place of government, then there would be peace and justice and love all around the world. Paul had seen the power of the gospel at work in himself and in the many, many people he had led to faith. He had seen the power of Jesus to transform people from bad into good. And he understood that the more people that came to know Jesus and love him, and have his spirit within them, then the more good there would be in the world. But more importantly, the greater the number of people there would be who would pass from death into eternal life. So perhaps we can see our own voyage through this pandemic as just a part of our missionary journey with the Spirit, during which we will try with his help to obey God's call to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. And we can do that by living holy Christian lives through telling people who Jesus is and through taking every opportunity to testify to Jesus' impact upon our lives just as Paul did. And even if that sharing of the gospel involves peril and risk for us and even if it results in suffering and sadness it will be worth it to know that we've done the will of God and that one day we will be counted among those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I never cease to marvel at how close the Spirit was to Paul throughout his travels and how the Spirit guided him, protected him and comforted him right through to the end. We are blessed to be able to receive and to sail with the same Spirit who loves each one of us as much as he loved Paul. My prayer is that as we sail on through these stormy waters, that you will feel the Spirit close by, that you will hear him and feel him as he warns you, guides you, protects you and comforts you, and finally brings you safely to shore. I'd like to finish with a prayer that comes from the book that our Zoom Bible study has just finished reading together. The book is called The Wild Spirit, and this is one of the prayers with which the author ended each chapter. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Give me the eye of the eagle 
let me see what is far off and pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven cloak me with the wings of the dove that your healing touch will be given and a broken world be mended amen